Well, in my first video, uh, the 10 rules for successful woodworking, I did say that there are more or less than 10 and it didn't take me long to come up with another 10, which I hope you find interesting. Of course, somebody mentioned, well, what about having fun? But having fun at woodworking isn't a rule, <laughs> the very opposite. But the interesting thing is that in order to have fun, I really think you need to learn the rules first because they lead on to having fun. At any rate, let's kick off with the first one, which I've called seeing the wood for trees. And by that, I mean that to be successful, you have to focus on what you're doing. But if you focus too closely, there's a chance you will fail to anticipate what you should do next. So because woodworking is generally multifaceted or multi-skilled, you know, you're, you're juggling with various processes that have to be done in a certain order, you really do have to balance, as I say, the focusing of your attention and the ability to anticipate. And of course, that ability to anticipate could also be called insight and insight comes with experience usually. So the second one, and there's no priority, is use a notepad or a sketch pad. You know, what you're doing when you're woodworking is using your head and your hands. And often there are checklists that you've got to memorize. Um, if you don't have a notepad and you're in the workshop, I often use a scrap of wood and write things down, such as the tools that I've got to use or the measurements of something. And of course, if you're designing, which really is problem solving, then you're going to be using a notepad or a sketch pad all the time. So I think drawing and sketching and taking notes is, is a tool that is part of the vocabulary of successful woodworking. Number three is understand how wood behaves. And basically wood shrinks and expands across the grain. It doesn't really shrink or expand lengthwise, but it is sensitive to moisture. And in fact, if you look at wood as being a sponge, you'll understand that it absorbs and loses moisture. And the moisture content generally should be very generally around 10%. But when you're making things in wood, it's worth just respecting how the wood wants to behave. And some woods, for instance, piranha pine, if you're sawing that, it will close up on the saw. And some mahoganies are like this, that the stresses within the wood uh, that happened while the tree was growing uh, are manifest when you start using tools. And of course, we all know that hardwoods are generally denser, but then balsa wood is a hardwood and it's about the softest wood on this planet and pitch pine is a soft wood and that's very hard. So understand material, understand wood, understand how it behaves. Number four, organize your tools. Yeah, well, I'm a fine one to talk. If you look at my workshop, I've got lots of different racks, uh, magnetic racks, uh, wooden cutaway racks, storage cupboards for my router bits, etc, uh, etc. Et and can I find a tool when I want it? No. <laughs> Well, yes and no, but you know what? Although I tend to be rather untidy myself, I do believe that organizing your tools is very important. It helps with clear thinking. So organize your tools, very, very important. Number five, don't be a woodworking snob. Uh, this just came into my head because let's be honest, there is a lot of snobbery in woodworking, like using very, very expensive tools, hand planes. Certain furniture makers will only use the most exotic and expensive timbers. Well, what I think I'm saying here is let's go for excellence rather than elitism. So the, the benefit of not being a woodworking snob means you have an open mind to some of the other rules. In fact, the next one applies to it, which is Number six, use the best material for the job because the best material may not necessarily be the most expensive. 
So if you're making, say, a window box to grow uh, flowers, then you're not going to use rosewood. You'll probably use a pine. And number seven, use the most appropriate construction. We could use the same example of a window box that uh, you wouldn't use dovetails on. You'd probably use butt joints and nail the box together. So that's always worth considering. Use the most appropriate construction and there's a huge vocabulary of joints, mortars and tenons, dovetails, housing joints, routed joints, uh, halving joints, etc, etc. Number eight, use the most appropriate finish. And I might add, or use no finish at all. And such is uh, the Danish tradition of just using a soap and allowing natural dirt, if you like, over a period of years to create a kind of patina. But finish really is important. And of course, there are lacquers, there are water-based varnishes, there are oils. Sometimes it's best to let the the wood breathe so certain oils will allow that and other times you may need to seal the wood like, uh, such as in boat building and you'd use an epoxy lacquer which is virtually 99% impervious and then you've got the difference between a gloss finish and a matte finish generally a gloss finish can make something look a, a little bit cheap but not always Sometimes it can really show it off, like um, a, a guitar neck and a guitar body. In fact, that's a good example because they can look a million dollars in either gloss or matte. Okay, next one, number nine, is be confident but not arrogant. And I say that because I, I do believe that confidence is very important at whatever you're doing, whether you're an ice skater or a musician or a woodworker but don't be arrogant because the arrogance can actually lead to accidents in the workshop so confidence I mean how do you get confidence I think one of the things is to try and find it within yourself and not listen too much to other people I mean here am I saying that when I'm delivering all these rules to you but it, it's a tricky one. I mean, may, maybe people are born with confidence. I know in my own case, I've had to earn my confidence uh, the hard way in just about everything I, I do. OK, the last one is number 10. Know when to break the rules. I felt I couldn't leave this out. And then I thought, well, what am I going to say? Because I'm doing this very much um, without a script, just uh, off the top of my head. And... There must be instances where you do break the rules because, you know, the, it's well known that you need to know the rules before you can break them. And this applies so often. And there are examples of design which break all the rules, but the, the design looks fantastic. Now, they're rare. So I have uh, put this as number 10, the last rule, because I, I think it's... It, it's something to bear in mind that when you know what the rules are then um, you've got permission to break them <laughs> and well I hope you've enjoyed this video and it gives you food for thought and please do leave constructive comments no doubt there are more rules that I've um, left out thanks for watching and uh, be safe and have fun <laughs>